but he'll calm down. Um, thanks everybody for joining us tonight for this um, Poetry as Hope presentation from Montana's two wonderful poet laureates, Emma Smoker and Melissa Kwasny. Um, they are presenting during National Poetry Month, which is April, um, and talking about poetry as a source of hope in the last incredibly difficult trying year. So they can do this much better than I can. So without further ado, um, Emma Smoker and Melissa Kwasny, please take the stage. Sorry, I'm just getting things set up here. It's hard to do this all on one little computer screen. <laughs> uh, well, welcome so much. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're really happy to be here with you in this um, virtual environment this evening. Uh, we'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement um, as part of our intentional practice to recognize the indigenous peoples on this continent. We'd like to offer up a collective land acknowledgement in our virtual setting as a way to honor the enduring relationships among the traditional stewards of this land and their traditional territories and homelands. <clears throat> we participate in this recognition as a way to show respect for the histories, cultures, lifeways, languages, and contemporary contributions of American Indians and Alaska Natives who have lived across this land since time immemorial. Um, I provided a link in the chat um, that I just really encourage uh, folks to check out and use. Um, I'll share my screen here for just a second and show you how it works. Um, it's a website called Native Land, um, and you can, you know, use this to zoom in really around the world and locate um, Indigenous peoples who might have called um, the area where you are living or near um, home. So I think for, if we're considering um, Bozeman area and um, Helena, and Basin where Melissa and I live, um, I think it's pretty safe to say that multiple tribes uh, used those areas, in particular the Crow, but also the Salish. Um, in addition to the Shoshone, Nez Perce and Arapaho sometimes um, traveled north um, into our regions as well. But I hope you'll use this resource in the future. Okay. Um, thank you to Corey Feifels for inviting us into the Bozeman Public Library. Um, we're happy to be here, as Mandy said, and, um, and we want to thank all of you who are in the audience, uh, your time and your attention on, on this first beautiful day, um, spring day. Um, Mandy and I were um, appointed Poets Laure Montana Poets Laureate in um, late 2019 by then Governor Steve Bullock. Um, there have been six poet laureates before us. Um, we served for two years, um, but this is the first time that this role has been shared um, by two people. Um, this was intentional. Um, during the nomination process, Mandy and I asked to be nominated together. Um, it was kind of an unusual thing, but we had hoped that, um, that sharing this position, working together um, would serve as, um, as a model for people, um, for creative collaboration, um, for solving problems um, and, and for having fun. Um, and it's been a great experience, although an unexpected one. Um, although we both come from marginalized communities, um, Mandy belongs to the Assiniboine and Sioux tribes of the Fort Peck Reservation, um, and I am gay. Our lives differ in a number of ways. Mandy, um, as I said, grew up in northeastern Montana on, at Fort Peck, and I was raised in a rural um, slash industrial town um, in Northern Indiana. Mandy is the mother of a nine-year-old. I do not have children. Um, 20 years separate us in age, but we are also both educators, poets, and lovers of literature, especially that written by indigenous writers and women. Most importantly, we both believe in poetry and its capacity to foster connections across 
um, differences and between people. Um, and that's why we're here. That's why we're doing this. Um, in the description of this uh, program tonight, um, we quote just, just a part of the Emily Dickinson poem that, mo that many of you may be familiar with, especially the first line, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. I'll read the whole thing to you. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Um, as Corey said, it's been quite a year. It's been quite a year to keep hope alive, right? for everyone. Um, as poet laureates, we had, um, like you, many future plans um, that we were excited about. And then um, a few months after our um, we began our tenure, the pandemic struck and all of our events and all of our classes, our meetings with uh, schools and students were canceled. Um, like many parents, Mandy struggled with homeschooling and the demands of a really challenging full-time job. Uh, I flew back and forth to Florida, um, which was a dangerous and frightening experience for me during that time, um, when my mother was suddenly bedridden and then um, passed this past November. We know that families across Montana, as well as the nation, are dealing with their own struggles and griefs. At the same time, like many of you, the violence and divisiveness that has gripped our nation has made us look for new ways to find, to fight for human rights and social justice and to maintain the struggle. In our own state legislature, for instance, we're seeing attacks on tribal sovereignty and voting rights and on the rights of LGBTQ citizens, especially tragically school-aged children. It is a time more than ever for creative collaboration and alliance, as in being allies. Mandy and I believe poetry can provide a necessary, a crucial medicine, even a path forward, because it is the language of the heart, of feeling, of connection, of hope for what poet Adrian Rich called the dream of a common language. Poetry reminds us that we each have an interior life, that what we feel matters, that we are worthwhile because of that interior life within us. Um, Melissa and I have known each other, I think, close to 20 years now. <laughs> um, we met, obviously, we both attended the University of Montana's um, MFA program. Uh, we're both um, mentored and, and students and friends of a professor, the, the late Patricia Godica, a, a wonderful poet. Um, but I think um, she, she knew that Melissa and I would... Um, find common ground and understandings and, and be able to be supportive of one another um, well into the future when she introduced us and, and brought us together. Um, since that time, you know, we, we talk poetry a lot. Um, we first collaborated um, on an anthology of human rights poetry um, entitled I Go to the Ruined Place um, about 10 years ago. And that was a really interesting and intense um, experience to solicit and gather and read poems um, from really around the world um, regarding human rights um, conditions, violations, um, just challenges. And so that, that bonded us together as well um, pretty closely. Um, and we were just really, as she said, looking forward to um, you know, our, our tenure together and all the big plans we had, um, you know, getting to, to meet Joy Harjo in, in Billings for the big read before the pandemic started was a highlight. Um, but then we were also very fortunate um, that the Missoula Art Museum reached out um, to us and asked us about a um, 
new exhibit called Love Letters to the Collection that they were, were just sort of bringing to life, bringing to fruition. And so Melissa and I, um, you know, got to go to the art museum before, before everything uh, closed down and spend some time with their really amazing native art collection that they have there. And just to, you know, again, take our time sort of side by side and, and engage with the art and, and ask questions and, you know, just find pieces that really resonated um, with us. And uh, we'd landed on one particular um, piece of art um, called um, Epicenters and Impacts, um, it's created by the wonderful artist, uh, Molly Murphy Adams, who is um, Oglala. And uh, I'll let Melissa tell you just a little bit more about this piece of art before we read our, our poems that we wrote to it. Um, Molly Murphy Adams um, does a lot of work, uh, bead work on unconventional pieces. Um, she, she uses maps frequently. Um, she did, she used a map and did a trail of tears um, with beads on it. She uses history, um, beadwork, uh, applique of, um, of materials. As you can see in here, there's, um, there's part of a dress with uh, elk teeth on it, a traditional um, dress in the upper um, right hand corner um, on velvet. She uses lots of different media. Um, and in this case, um, this is a piece that Molly did not, not for ex exhibition and not for sale, but because she was very moved by the number of um, missing and murdered indigenous women um, and men that, um, that, uh, that we know about in Montana. And um, this map is a map of the um, of Missoula and the Salish um, reservation. And um, if you look closely, there are small um, circles that are made with red beads. And those mark a place where a woman was assaulted or um, went missing um, last time that she was seen uh, or, um, or was murdered, and so um, so she made this piece as a kind of honoring, um, and then uh, donated it to the Missoula Museum. And so, just the history of it, um, the intention of it, um, made us decide to choose this together. So I'll start off by reading uh, the poem that I wrote um, for this beautiful piece first. Um, it's called The Book of the Missing, Murdered, and Indigenous, Chapter One, for Natalie Smoker. The winding cord of highways, unkempt gravel roads, and the trails of animals, a record of who and what has passed over, an agony of secrets. In the end, they have all borne witness eyes like glass beads that can never blink. The dull light of motel neon shines ominously, an engine growls across the landscape. Brittle men who are splintered like glass thrown from a second story window, and we are the room they leave behind. They are pathetic husks, feeble in spirit. Fragments fall along the fields and shallow ditches in overlooked alleyways or underpasses. A cold, empty breeze rising from the debris, the first and last moment of her. It is rage that pulls her up from this place. She spews out the wretched and miserable as particles of dawn lit soil illuminate her skin. Her hair is a two-edged sword. She stitches together the collective story of origin, her body a map descended from the stars on the backs of animal sisters carried to safety in a bird's beak. Um, there's a lot of information out um, 
about missing and murdered indigenous peoples. And, um, and now there is um, in Montana, we have a task force that's monitoring those, um, which is a, a good um, step forward. Um, one thing that really struck me when I was um, just doing some research was that uh, Native people are four times more likely to go missing um, than white people in Montana, and that 80% of them are teenagers, which, um, which really um, breaks my heart, um, think, thinking about that. Um, I call my poem Overlay uh, because, as you can see in the artwork, it, it is a uh, palimpsest. It's um, material overlaid against, in this case, a vintage um, Forest Service map. Overlay. She starts with a map. In the lower right corner, there should be a compass rose, but how to orient in the accumulation of such loss? Plotted and pieced, the green might have sheltered them in forests of spruce and pine, blue square of willow copse by the waterway, golden rods signaling the empty, endless miles. Instead, the colors declare by whom the earth is owned. Atop the official grid, she begins to superimpose her own designs. Here, a remnant of red silk velvet, a best dress laid upon the ground, stitched with rows of trade bead and cowries. If we could only read the floral pattern she has sewn around it, the Salish fabric leaves, bitter root like a birthmark, mountain bluebell, the stems and herbal seams, if we could the beaded circles that mark where each woman at last was seen, beside which grief sits, reaching her arm far as possible down the well. Every culture seems to have a story about a daughter disappearing into earth or sky. The black bear overtakes her, a snake bites her, a white swing, swan slowly spreads his wings. In the end, it is always said to be her fault. She was drinking, she was hitchhiking, she was too beautiful, she was with a man. She is dragged to the underworld or sent to live with the stars. In the worst places, the circles cluster like a ring toss. Everywhere, the highways expand. Their yellow lines, the danger zones, the women crossed in common, in truth. The map still begs for their return. I stood outside the Capitol and watched a, a mother cry, wind through her hair enough to break my heart. I think, um, you know, it's pretty obvious <laughs> that the appreciation that Melissa and I have, um, and, and not just for being, a, you know, for writing poetry, but for just really um, loving it in, in all forms um, and being able to, you know, really sort of immerse yourself um, in the experiences, the ideas, um, the forms, um, you know, whatever, whatever poets might choose. Um, and use to express themselves. Um, for me, poetry is really, you know, like a, a glue that sort of holds everything together. Um, you know, who I am and, and where I come from, as Melissa talked about, um, is, you know, the, the foundation of really my, my core, my core belief system. And poetry though, um, because it is for me so detailed oriented and so specific, um, it always finds a way to reconnect me and bring me back to, to land and water, um, to family, um, you know, to, to plant and animal life. Um, and I always really appreciate that as well about Melissa's work um, and the very, very um, intricate sort of um, pieces and, and parts 
of an image um, that that she can really just truly bring to life. Um, and so I, I appreciate that about about her work in particular. Um, I think we'd both say that poetry has been um, a form of sustenance as well. Um, you know, for me, it's a, a way to retell and, and reclaim uh, the story of my home, of my family, my culture and language um, as an Assiniboine woman. And, you know, my piece of this literary fabric is just one small piece of this really big and um, finally the time when we get to reclaim and retell that narrative. Um, one that really highlights our, the beauty and the resilience of, of who we are. Um, so, you know, I always look forward to the day when there's going to be more poets, artists, playwrights, musicians um, who continue to share our story in contemporary times uh, where we can speak to all aspects of our lives, our histories, our cultures, and our ways of knowing and being. Um, there's one poem in particular that I wanted to share um, as part thinking about that trajectory. And this is a poem by um, a, a a person who I deeply admire um, from the Fort Bel Belknap Reservation, um, Minerva Allen, and um, also an Assiniboine um, and Grovant writer. Um, and this poem is one that I always teach of hers to students, um, again, because of the intimacy, because of the detail, um, and because of, I, I look at it as a, a slow window that was opened for us um, to, to step into Minerva's world. Um, and what an honor that is for us as a reader. This is called Beautiful Existence. Death, my friend, is not long. Wrapped in a tanned buffalo robe, painfully I sank to the floor, forcing my aching knee joints to bend. I sat cross-legged, fumbling for my ceremonial pipe, filling it with tobacco from a small pouch, lit it. Smoke wreathed around my head. I felt for my drum and began a faint tapping on the taut rawhide. The voice that one sang, once sang from mountain tops, echoing along beaver streams. Softly, I sang a chant of death. All is quiet. We've, you know, talked about, I think, you know, some of the topics that we find important um, are often contemporary sort of circumstances, um, things that are, you know, in our hearts and on our minds. Um, and one of those for me is always um, native languages, and in particular, my own language, and thinking about language loss, but then also, you know, being so incredibly inspired by language revitalizers, those language warriors out there that are working incredibly hard um, to keep our languages in this world as a very, very key connection and element of who we are as, as native people. You know, to know that your language was made in a very specific place to define and um, establish connection with, um, you know, the natural world and, and the things that were around you and the types of relationships that existed, you know, among tribal peoples, among indigenous peoples. Um, so this this poem is sort of contemplating um, language loss and also thinking about um, my own son and how to bring um, more of, of the language alive inside of him as well. So this is called We Are the Ones and it's for Desmond. Waiting, a syllable forming generating energy in small dark masses, marrow, stem cell, neuron. Waiting to come alive again in this tiny body. Guwa, you should learn this word between you and I, my son, Bukshina. Come here, come home to this place. Between you and I, no separation, but always room and silence until we can find meaning in the words together. I repeat it again and again, gesturing for you to come over, hoping the vibrations will come alive and you will listen inside yourself. 
you will sense just who you are, who you belong to and among. As if you were underwater and could feel your pulse, the whir and the swish of your blood traveling miles and miles across the wind-blown graves of your great-grandparents and their grandparents. Mikushi, Mitugashi, yours, and they are out there belonging to you before you were even born, waiting. So um, I think there's one more poem that I'm going to read before I turn it over um, to Melissa. Um, you know, in my, my career in education, I've been really fortunate to travel um, across Montana and work with different communities um, to really hopefully build um, local community-based strategies, you know, from the ground up. And I just got to spend a lot of time on the Blackfeet Reservation um, in the community of, of Heart Butte. Um, and I'm just grateful for all the things that were shared with me as part of that journey. And um, just, you know, I, if you have ever driven that part of the Rocky Mountain front, um, you know, the Blackfeet call it the backbone of the world. Um, and it's just very um, special and very compelling. So I was, I was thinking about Heart Butte um, when my time there had kind of come to an end for, for work. Um, and wanted to, to write something about what a special place it was. So this is called Heart Butte, Montana. The unsympathetic wind, how she has evaded me for years now, leaving a guileless shell and no way to navigate. Once when I stood on a plateau of earth, just at the moment before the dangerous jutting peaks converged upon the sway of grasslands, I almost found a way back. There, the sky, quite possibly all the elements, caused the rock and soil and vegetation to congregate. Their prayer was not new and so faint I could hardly discern. Simple remembrances, like a tiny syncopated chorus calling everyone home across a thousand eastward miles and what little wind was left at my back. I could not move and then the music was gone. All that was left were the springtime faces of mountains gazing down their last patches of snow luminous. I dreamed of becoming snowmelt gliding down the slope of history and into the valley with the purpose and with the promise and assurance that there is always a way to become bird, tree, water again. Mandy, thank you for reading the Minerva Allen poem. Um, I have seen, I've read that poem a number of times. It's in um, the Office of Public Instruction did an anthology of native um, poetry from Montana called Birthright. And that poem is in it, but it's really different to hear a poem read aloud than it is seeing it on the page. And all kinds of doors opened up in that poem to me hearing you read it. Um, and, and that's something, um, I think um, the audience members, um, maybe this is your first poetry reading or maybe it's your 100th poetry reading, um, but always to remember it's a completely different experience to hear poetry read aloud. Um, you might not get all of the things that you would get when you read it on the page, but um, hearing it aloud, it, it really is a musical art form. And, um, and that, was, that was good to hear. Thank you. One thing I like to tell students, um, students of any age, um, is that I never thought um, when I was younger, I never thought I would grow up to be a poet. Um, I didn't even know that there were living poets. I thought um, poets were raised with extensive libraries. Um, I have my poetry library back here just so you can see it. Um, 
but I thought they had extensive libraries that they grew up traveling to Europe with, you know, their professor parents and um, or their or their parents were famous artists and, you know, they they knew everything that I didn't know. Um, and when I was when I was young, because of what I read in school, I thought that all poets were white and they were long dead and they were from England, right? Because that's what we read in English class. Um, things have really changed since then. But I thought at that time, um, I never conceived of myself being a poet. My, um, my mother's parents were tenant farmers. Um, they, were, they were pretty poor. Um, my father's parents were Polish immigrants um, and my parents, um, worked all the time in the bar that they owned with my um, paternal grandparents. Um, so there wasn't a lot of time for reading, let alone poetry. Um, but one day I had a public school teacher who came into my freshman high school class um, reciting Chaucer. Um, he had a, it was, you know, you can find all kinds of things in the public schools you know this guy um, had a PhD in Chaucer studies and so he would come in and just recite it every day and I had no idea what language that was that he was reciting but I thought it was a, it was like a spell it was so musical and um, enchanting in um, in a way I had never heard before and Suddenly I was hooked. Um, he had to start writing poems. Um, I found that it was a voice um, for me. And, um, and even though I did it in quiet, in secret, um, I still kept doing it. Uh, in 1977, or not 77, when, in 1974, I moved to Missoula and um, to go to undergraduate school. And I met Richard Hugo who had um, who is a poet that had much the same background that I um, that I did. Uh, he worked, uh, he was raised by his maternal grandparents. My maternal grandparents um, raised us until we were in school, um, old enough to take care of ourselves because our parents were working. Um, his, he worked at the Boeing factory, so he knew that kind of working class life. Um, and he loved, he wrote about bars. Um, he wrote about small towns and broken down small towns and, um, and things that, that I felt very familiar with. And, um, and what happened is, it was it was revelatory to me that literature all of a sudden could be about real people like people like my family or or people that I knew and um, and in that same way I think as an educator when I bring in poems um, in Spanish to a class where there are Spanish speakers when I bring in poems by um, indigenous writers or African American writers and suddenly you can see students go oh they're writing about their lives their, their lives are somewhat like mine um, and it really um, is it's a transformative experience um, and changes your relationship to literature to poetry to fiction to all kinds of literature um, I often think to um, talk to students about what poets do, because poets do a lot of different things, but, um, but being a poet means that you write poetry. But, but most of your time as a poet isn't used in writing the poems, it's, it's in paying attention, paying attention to the outside world, using your five senses, um, what William Blake called chief inlets of soul in this age. Um, the way to get to the spirit or the soul is actually through the body, through the five, using your five senses, what you can see and hear and touch and smell. Um, and a poet's job is to develop those senses, to refine them, um, so to speak, um, to become more and more attentive. Um, and, and so, My fourth book, um, I 
I entitled The Nine Senses because I had read something um, about the Sufis believing that there were nine senses and that there were four additional ones besides the one the commonplace ones we think of, um, including clairvoyance, teleportation, telekinesis. Um, and so I wrote a whole book kind of exploring those different senses. And as I went around reading from that book, uh, a lot of people came to me and said that they there were much more than um, five, many more than five senses, nine senses. They'd say, what about the sense of humor, right? Um, what about, um, you know, somebody that, who's a painter has a sense of color that's very different than, um, what about synesthesia, which is senses crossing over one another, being able to see colors when you hear music. So lots of different things. So um, I'm gonna start with a poem um, that came from those discussions with audience members called Counting the Senses to sense the dead around us in places where they are attached or to sense past lives within the present one. To sense the presence of birds or animals on the roadside in the dark or the moods of birds or animals, let alone people. There are tribes who can orient even in the fog, naming the direction east or west that they are facing. There is the ability to see through lies, to feel an enemy at your back, to detect poison without taste, to douse for water. You were up before dawn, walking the shore, picking up broken bits of plastic and shell, to sense in ever refined levels the dissipating cloud layers of oneself, what Ezra Pound named an aristocracy of emotion. In the spruce copse near the confluence, you left your hair. Last night we played Scrabble. My first word was divine. You added an S to it, doubling your score. In this very room, 14 years ago, you turned over and found the lump. Your hand rose to it as if guided by a sense of love. I live in a little town called Basin um, between Butte and Helena um, in Jefferson County. And, uh, and Boulder is just seven miles um, north of here. And it's a beautiful valley, um, huge valley um, with lots of ranches in it. And, um, and in February and in March, I often um, drive the back road and just wait for the first um, calves that are being born and, um, and watch that. And it's some, some kind of sign of spring um, when it's really, really cold. And so this is, um, this is a poem I chose because of that, but also because it's using those senses that I was talking about. The black calf. The black calf wakes into a world it has no memory of. Adamantine, February cold, above it a coarse blue, into a feedlot with hundreds of others. To wake, one is fortunate, but to have been awakened, to have been born, bleary eyed, stunned, and slick with mucus. Suddenly a heifer's water breaks. We watch her walk the yard. Agitated, she lies down, lowing. Then up in one motion and the birth sack drops, long and thin like spittle that soon takes on dimension. Through ghost cloth, the calf's limbs poke out. All premonition, they say, is of terror. To have a body, to be an animal is muddy business, shit and hay. And bloody afterbirth, we see another cow eating. We have a limited number of years to explore the earth, to know pre-dawn, undergrowth in shadow, noon in its clean lines. Within minutes, the black calf tries to stand. 
I love watching those calves. Like they must just be so bewildered. Like look around, <laughs> it's cold here. And, and how, how do, what are these legs for? And then they do, they just stand up. Um, so I'm going to end with a poem from my latest book, which is called Where Outside the Body is the Soul Today. And, um, and in this book, um, I was thinking about, um, thinking about the spirit or the soul and where we find it. And um, what, I, what I discovered is that it was much easier to find it externally than internally um, in people, seeing it in people, seeing it in students, seeing it in trees, um, seeing it in things that are outside us. So this is just one of them. There's lots of them um, called, uh, letters to the soul. This is one. Where in the body is the soul today? Anatomy, not astronomy. Look this morning at the deer sleeping on its side in a pile of leaves. Put yourself there under the stars, protected really from nothing, having to trust the air or gray solitaire on the bare branch of the extreme cold, where outside the body is the soul today. It will seem as if it is happening all around you, as if the sun had moved into a new phase, pale, breathless, a bottomless blue, a sentimental crochet of clouds at the edge work. The woman who made her friends promise not to parade her in public after she lost her mind found such joy in the choir that they were torn, which is, is a feeling you have forgotten, hope one might say, the tilting that is change on the axis. If there is someone in the wind, there is someone in the mountain. If the soul is back there in the child that was harmed, it is also in the older girl who takes her hand, leading her through the burning trees which breathe out emeralds. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you both so much for sharing your work with us tonight moving. Um, we do have, uh, you know, we have time left for questions. I, we do have one poem that's not ours that we wanted to close with, but we can wait a few minutes to do that. I think, so we had a few more people in here, but they seem to have dropped. But if anybody left has any questions, they'd like um, to type into the chat window or use the Q&A feature on Zoom, please do. And otherwise, we'd love to hear the last poem you have tonight. Great. Um, so we, we just love Joy Harjo so much. <laughs> uh, Muskogee Creek um, Poet Laureate um, for the United States. Um, you know, she's just a, a remarkable person. And um, she wrote this poem several years ago, but it sort of got a revival during the pandemic um, because she had said, she read it um, online somewhere, which you can go and listen to, it's beautiful. Um, but she really thought that it um, might help um, since we were feeling so isolated and, um, you know, disconnected that, she hoped folks um, might turn to this poem and feel a little relief from that. So this is called For Calling the Spirit Back from Wandering the Earth in Its Human Feet. Put down that bag of potato chips, that white bread, that bottle of pop. Turn off that cell phone, computer, and remote control. Open the door, then close it behind you. Take a breath offered by friendly winds. They travel the earth gathering essences of plants to clean. Give it back with gratitude.
If you sing, it will give your spirit lift to fly to the stars, ears, and back. Acknowledge this earth who has cared for you since you were a dream, planting itself precisely within your parents' desire. Let your moccasin feet take you to the encampment of the guardians who have known you before time, who will be there after time. They sit before the fire that has been there without time. Let the earth stabilize your post-colonial insecure jitters. Be respectful of the small insects, birds, and animal people who accompany you. Ask their forgiveness for the harm we, do, we humans have brought down upon them. Don't worry. The heart knows the way through. The heart knows the way. Though there may be high rises, interstates, checkpoints, armed soldiers, massacres, wars, and those who will despise you because they despise themselves. The journey might take you a few hours, a day, a year, a few years, a hundred, a thousand, or even more. Watch your mind. Without training, it might run away and leave your heart for the immense human feast set by the thieves of time. Do not hold regrets. When you find your way to the circle, to the fire kept burning by the keepers of your soul, you will be welcomed. You must clean yourself with cedar, sage, or other healing plant. Cut the ties you have to failure and shame. Let go the pain you are holding in your mind, your shoulders, your heart, all the way to your feet. Let go the pain of your ancestors to make way for those who are heading in our direction. Ask for forgiveness. Call upon the help of those who love you. These helpers take many forms, animal, element, bird, angel, saint, stone, or ancestor. Call your spirit back. It may be caught in corners and creases of shame, judgment, and human abuse. You must call in a way that your spirit will want to return. Speak to it as you would to a beloved child. Welcome your spirit back from its wandering. It may return in pieces and tatters. Gather them together. They will be happy to be found after being lost for so long. Your spirit will need to sleep a while after it is bathed and given clean clothes. Now you can have a party. Invite everyone you know who loves and supports you. Keep room for those who have no place else to go. Make a giveaway and remember, keep the spirit speeches short. Then you must do this, help the next person find their way through the dark. I love this, I love this poem, how poems always teach us how to live. I think we go to them um, for, for all those lessons. Um, I wanna thank everyone and I especially wanna thank um, my co-poet laureate, Mandy Smoker, um, who I'm honored to share this position with. Yes, thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much for being here. And we had a comment in the chat, somebody wrote in, we are so grateful for all that you have taught us, your voices are singing. So that's a very lovely compliment. I wanted to make sure you guys saw before logging off. Um, I, think, I think they ask who the photograph of the happy little boy is. <laughs> yeah, but, um, I, wrote, I, I wrote her back. That is um, the library assistant director's um, son who's now like 20 years old so it's quite an old photo but this photo brings us joy <laughs> I just I typically turn off my video and the presentation start because you don't need to see me but that's uh Leo is his name and then we have another comment thank you all so much thank you all so much for being here we really appreciate it um and hope to see you in person in the future thank you thank you Take care, you guys. Thanks again.